everyone to this issue of the Freedom Hub's Free Market Cash Patient. I'm your host, Jeff Cantor, along with Charles Froman. We are definitely sponsored by your Freedom Hub and also your marketplace for health, wealth, and freedom, which we'll investigate. It's at your-mp.com. And we are absolutely the disruptors intersection, as you will typically find whenever you attend. We have a problem in the health world, and it's been becoming more and more obvious to many. We could change the name on that individual in the center is really what the larger ramifications are, but that's where that goes. Mm -hmm. And also the information is rather mixed. So we really don't know what to pay attention to or what to believe. So that's been a challenge as well. And then as a little sidebar, we actually have a different show that we engage in and that's on earlier on Wednesdays. So please take a chance to check that out. That's on broader based liberty issues. And as I said, you want to investigate the site. This again is the main link. The videos are archived there. We'll, we'll take a quick peek. And then here at the bottom, if you're inclined to find a special alternative to your typical run the meal health insurance, you want to really kind of join that cutting edge. This is the website you want to go to patientempowerment.mpb.health. All right, let's take a quick detour before we dig in for today. When you come to the your-mp.com website, you'll notice there's a whole variety of drop downs to pick from. There's some great stuff on here. We're on the tab under home. You'll see webinars and continuing the conversation. Webinars about what's going on tonight, but the conversation continuation is important. Let's take a quick detour. And this is for the situation where what you've heard is really compelling. And I want to either start to work with this person or help support them. All right, let's roll into today. So if you come on the home screen, you'll see the webinar tab. And then under that one, um, we have a little run on what we're doing and then an introduction to the various guests. Also down here, what's coming up. And then here's the links to the ones as we archive them. So just as a quick uh, diversion here, let's check on this one. So this weekend, this video will be up and posted. You'll be able to come back here and enjoy it or share it with others that weren't here today. And so that's how you'll find out about what uh, what we've been doing in the past. So Charles, why don't you do the honors here and introduce our guest today? Gladly, Jeff, and welcome Carmelo. His uh, topic isn't directly health. It is around the idea of life insurance, but where it indirectly does intersect with a topic of great interest to our free market cash patient goals is the long-term care costs that hit the elderly. And we have had several present presentations over the past couple of years on that topic, whether it's you know living benefits around life insurance from my agent, Leah Garcia, who presented, uh, or Jeff, your colleague, Sam Piccioni, uh, with his debt reduction and software ideas to help people build uh, assets or money for those expenses, or even Rich Keel, who presented LifeBridge uh, around the same kind of uh, empowering your asset growth so you can be protected in your vulnerable times in old age. And I think it was Fidelity that uh, published that study showing people in their 80s and 90s will face over 100 grand in out-of-pocket health care costs, you know, particularly from the skilled nursing care bills. Uh, even two or three hundred thousand dollars, it's going to be really expensive. And the private long-term care insurance policies that were going to be the answer collapsed over the past uh, half decade or so from problems in pricing up those policies and some actuarial failures. Uh, people are discovering to their shock that Medicare has lots of gaps in what it covers. And a lot of folks have been trying to, uh, you know, get rid of their assets so that they could qualify for Medicaid, but even Medicaid has tightened its rules. So the topic of affording the big bills in retirement is gonna be a hot topic for a long time. So Carmelo's um, business 
and helping folks cash out their life insurance policies to get that money for the expensive bills, we, we think is an important topic to learn about uh, and explore. Um, you know, Carmelo, like a lot of us, didn't come into this industry uh, purposefully or, you know, as, as a goal. It was an accident, as he'll probably tell in his story. He was a realtor uh, marketing for prospects. And I guess one, one of the prospects was in the life settlement business. And, you know, he, Carmelo still does some, um, some realtor property uh, business, but this is his focus now. And so we want, we want to learn all about it, Jeff. Very good. All right. On that note, Carmelo, I'm going to release the screen to you. Absolutely. All right. So my name is Carmelo. I'm the owner of Private Wealth Management. Give me one second. I'm trying to, there we go. Okay. Um, what we do is we help seniors get more cash for their life, their life insurance policy than if they were to just uh, release it back to the life insurance company. So we'll go through a few slides. Um, basically, I'll go over a quick overview. Uh, some benefits, uh, cases that would qualify, uh, life settlement process, the underwriting and pricing, uh, tax treatment, as well as deal sourcing. Um, so with life settlements, oops, I'm sorry, you can see here roughly 900 billion um, in death benefit are lapsing each year and approximately 88% of universal life policies uh, are resulting in no claim. So there's a lot of people paying for policies that aren't utilizing them or able to take advantage of them. And the insurance company ultimately is the one that tends to be the winner in this case. Um, so as I said, life settlements will provide significantly more cash value uh, or more significantly more cash for their policy than surrendering it for the cash value. Um, if you see an overview here, I'm gonna minimize this, sorry guys. Um, this kind of explains what a life uh, settlement is. So the sale of an existing policy and the proceeds are gonna exceed the cash surrender value. It has to for it to make sense. Um, the investor or the buyer is gonna become the new policy owner as well as the beneficiary, and they're going to assume the payments. And in turn, uh, the policy owner is going to receive a cash offer for the policy. It is important to note that there is no obligation for them to accept the offer, and I take no fees if they don't accept. So it's, it has to benefit them, their family, their advisor. If they talk about it, they figure something out that works. If it doesn't, that's fine. Um, so benefits to the policyholder. It's going to eliminate an unneeded insurance policy as well as the costs associated. Uh, proceeds from the life settlement can be used however the client wishes. And it's going to provide capital um, to purchase a new policy, an annuity, or as we would mentioned earlier, a long-term care product or help fund long-term care. Uh, some parameters. I broke this down into two categories. We have 500,000 and above, and then we have the lower policies, 100 to 500,000. Uh, a general rule of thumb is you want the client to be 70 or older. They can be younger if there are health concerns, but a good rule of thumb is 70 or older. Uh, I'll start on the side 500,000 plus. Uh, we can do universal life, survivorship, uh, convertible term and some whole life. We try to avoid um, um, variable. Uh, as far as health conditions, it can be minor, moderate, major health concerns here. Now, this is not a viatical life settlement. It's important to note that. With viatical, it's two years or less. Um, whereas here, you can see they can have a life expectancy of 165 plus months. That's quite a few years. Uh, it is important to note, however, that the lower the life expectancy, the higher the offer because the purchasers of these policies, this is an investment for them. Uh, moving over to the smaller policies, um, we can do a phone interview on these and that's gonna make it so we can close the case faster. Now, if the client wants to try to maximize the offer, we absolutely can still get the life expectancies and, and run through the entire case the, the way we would with any other case. But there are times where money is needed right now they don't care, they just need the money. And if that happens to be the scenario, then we can do a health phone interview or phone health interview. Uh, same thing, 70 or older, 100 to 500,000. Uh, the only difference here is uh, we have to make sure that we're out of the contestability period. That's gonna be for any policy that, that we work a life settlement on. Um, but for the health on this, uh, for the lower ones, it's gonna need to be you know, moderate to maybe major health concerns. 
what we do for agents, uh, we're going to order all the required documentation. We'll get APSs. Uh, we're going to order two LEs. An LE is a life expectancy report on each file. Um, I already mentioned there is an option for a phone interview for lesser policies, 100, 200,000, 300,000. Uh, those would be closing faster. The average time to close a case it depends on how fast we can get documentation, frankly. So three weeks to two months is a good time frame to be looking at. And if the agent can work with me or if I can get a document signed, allow me to call and work directly with the providers, it's going to allow me to really expedite that process. But when it comes to requiring the, the medical records, uh, that tends to take the longest. Um, so we're going to order enforce illustrations as well as other documentations, premium history, uh, any, any documentation that we're going to need to be able to sell this. We're also going to shop it. Right now we're working with 28 buyers. Uh, we're always looking for more buyers, but we have 28 right now that we know are actively purchasing policies. So the cases will go to all 28 buyers. And what we'll do is we're going to make sure that we bring the bids as well as uh, show our comp. So everything is completely transparent with any agent that chooses to work with us. Um, we're also going to provide guidance and educate. Now this can be on a case by case basis. Some agents want me to talk to their clients about this with them on the phone, of course. Uh, others, they want me to explain it to them and then they will talk to their clients. So whatever the agent is comfortable with, we're comfortable with. That's fine. We're here to provide a service. Um, underwriting. So underwriting for a life settlement is completely different than underwriting for new life insurance. With new life insurance, we want as healthy as possible, um, as young as possible, non-smoker, non-drinker, non-obese. Whereas on this side, it's different. There are allowed to be health concerns. Uh, and in fact, it's going to come down for the investor to the life expectancy as well as health reports. So, uh, it may sound a little morbid, but the less healthy a person is, the higher an offer is going to be. And again, they never have to accept it. They don't want to. Um, so this is an investment for the buyers. It's an opportunity for the client to obtain a cash offer that's significantly higher than the cash surrender value for a policy that they don't want or need. That's important to note because we're not just chasing people with policies and trying to sell a policy. No. These are people that were most likely going to lapse their policy anyway, because maybe their children don't need it or they can't afford to keep the policy. So again, it is a service. Um, and life expectancies don't have to be short. Like I said, the majority of our cases tend to have a life expectancy between 70 and 150 months. Uh, pricing and valuation. Uh, pricing is gonna be based on a few factors, including the policy, face amount, premium payments, loans, uh, cash value, carrier ratings, life expectancy, as well as the overall health of the insured. Uh, funders are gonna base their valuation on their return, because again, this is their investment. Uh, the cost of capital, as well as uh, analyzing the LEs, as well as premium reserves, because they have to, on top of purchasing the policy, they have to make sure they have enough premium reserved to maintain payments, um, even if the insured lives past their life expectancy. So there, there is a buffer there. Um, I have an example. So this example is a 72 year old female. She had uh, stage two breast cancer. She was in remission for breast cancer as well, but she ended up getting it again. Um, she had a convertible term, 250,000. Conversion premium was 9,900. Um, life expectancies, we ordered two life expectancy reports on this case. And as you can see, they came in at 27 and 29 months respectively. Uh, her gross offer was 124,000. As far as comp, we generally do a 60, 40 split. If an agent's bringing us more cases, uh, then their commission will be more aggressive, obviously. Uh, but this is a good foundation. It's, it's our starting place. So we pulled 24,000 in cop, 14,400 went to the agent plus the commissionable premium on the conversion. And then we took 9,600 for our services on this. Now you gotta remember for this 70 year old female, this is a, um, a term policy. So she'd get nothing for it. 
you know, she couldn't maintain the payments because her health bills were too much. Another example, uh, two million pack life uh, survivorship. The male was 88, female 87. Um, same thing, uh, it became an affordability issue for them. So they were gonna surrender the policy, take the cash surrender value. We ended up securing three times that amount. They netted 240,000. You can see the LEs here of uh, 52 and 63 months. And you can see the comp, we pulled 40,000 out of this, 24 to the agent, 16 to PWM, and 240 uh, over to the insured. As far as tax treatment, I need to make sure that it's aware that I am not a tax advisor and I'm not providing any tax advice. That being said, um, premiums paid almost always amount to more than the life settlement offer. So any cash offer that's below the amount of premiums paid in over the course of, of their life insurance, it's, un, it's not taxable. So the majority of the time, the entire cash offer is gonna be tax free. And then we're gonna get into deal sourcing. So this is not something you're gonna find from a just random calling people. It's gonna come from your book of business. That's the most successful way to do it. Some things for agents to be looking for, clients over 70 or 65 with some health concerns. Um, look for end of guarantee, conversion periods, surrender requests, uh, replacements, and death claims on, on survivorship policies. And that's, that's really the gist of it. That's the basics. Um, I'd open the floor to questioning if anybody has any questions at this point. Absolutely. We'll definitely want to entertain that. That was very good. And it is a valuable service. I know, like you said, sometimes it sounds a little morbid, but, you know, to the person that's getting that money, it's not morbid to them. Right. Yeah. I mean, it took me a moment to be able to work in this field because I felt that way. But when you realize, I mean, I've worked in sales, real estate, life insurance, I've never had a client thank me. When you do this and you have somebody pull over on the side of the road crying and thanking you that they had money and they can actually pay their medical bills and get the care they need, it really makes you feel good and it makes you want to find the next person that you can help. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it was to them was an investment. I mean, that's why I was paying for this life insurance all these years. And then it's to watch it poof go away. You know, no wonder they're excited about it. I was going to say on your, my question would be on the 28 buyers that you're talking about are those individuals or those investor groups who typically is buying these things right so the majority of the time you're going to work with institutional investors these are hedge funds or large groups um, that have significant capital uh, that being said there are some private investors but you have to be a bit more careful working with them and they have to be accredited uh, it can't just be joe schmo down the street trying to buy a policy um, so there are regulations surrounding uh, who can purchase life insurance policies. Mm -hmm. And the reason I did ask, is I can't imagine one person buying. I mean, once they bought a handful of policies, they're kind of done. So I'd have to be like an institution or somebody that can keep going forward. Absolutely. So that's and then good. You got to think too, they're not just buying the policy and moving on. They have to maintain those premiums. Yeah, that's true. That's a big point for sure. Charles, I see your hand up. Carmelo, <clears throat> this is very uh, innovative and I think your image there of the old person crying because now they have money for their uh, otherwise unaffordable health expense, not to mention the unaffordable you know, premiums that they otherwise would have to pay, you know, makes it sound like a, a really a feel good story. Uh, tell me more about a couple of these elderly folks who have all this money now from uh, selling their life policy. Did they get the money they needed for their expense? I mean, was the settlement, uh, the settlement, uh, did it give them, you know, enough of a fund where they could afford all their bills? Did it really solve the problem? That's a good question. And that's going to depend on their policy. You know, if they have a hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy, um, the offer is going to be minimal in comparison to someone that has a three, four, $5 million policy. Um, but it's definitely going to help and it's going to be significant, especially when you're talking about a term policy where they're not going to get anything for it and they're running out of money and, and they can't afford their bills. So it gives them an opportunity. And if it can't fund the entire thing, um, there are options out there to, to provide assistance for in-home care. I know you focus more on long-term care, but um, 
it, it definitely helps. I can't say that this is the magical formula that is going to pay for everything, but we will do our best to maximize the return on their investment, which is their life insurance policy. And again, they don't have to take it if they deem it's not valuable enough. Jeff, if I Jared, can follow up. Uh, Jared, oh yeah, go ahead. You can do a follow up and I'm gonna call Jared. Oh, okay. Um, so if it's not enough, I mean, do you uh, ever counsel them or uh, have advice for them on where else they might get money? Because that's what this is all about, right? They're desperate, they need money. You're gonna help them to a certain degree, maybe all of it. Um, I mean, where else can they turn if it's not, if not for you? Really? All I do is I focus on the life settlement side of that. If they need additional income, they can talk to their advisor. Um, I don't really have resources put together at this point, but that's definitely something I need to look into and see if I can help find other resources for them to, to be able to fund their, their care needs. Jared. That's interesting. And then last one is um, uh, you're recruiting agents. How is that recruiting going? So, I recruit agents as well as uh, IMOs and general agencies. So it's, it really depends. You know, I talk to a lot of people. Some of them don't necessarily want to open up to this yet. But the point is, is we're capturing more and more states where regulation is requiring it to be manda mandatory uh, to offer a life settlement if a policy is going to lapse. Right now, I believe we have 14 states. So as this realm continues to grow, it's going to be something that's mandatory. So for agents that are thinking, I don't want to say thinking ahead, but for, for agents that are looking for a better opportunity for their clients, opposed to just lapsing the policy, this is phenomenal. And it's not going to be something where you're going to bring 10 clients and, and you know, it's this magic fountain of wealth. The point is, is this is one more tool, one more asset for the advisor to have. So as a case arises, as they hear something from one of their clients, they say, you know what, I think I have something that, that might be worth looking into. And if it doesn't work out, there's no cost involved. But if it does work out, it could provide you additional resources or income. All right, very good. Uh, Jared, please, if you would. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, Carmelo, this is all for end of life. Is that correct? Like, what do you mean? Like, as far as their their policy being expired because of either health or essentially kind of age, end of life type deal, right? They they're trying to unload it before they before they basically just lose it. Yes. So it could be for a multitude of reasons. So. Again, maybe they, they just need the money and they can't afford the policy and they're considering lapsing the policy. So in that case, we're going to be able to provide them more money for the policy opposed to lapsing it. Um, another scenario would be major health concerns where they need money to pay for that now and they're considering dropping their life insurance in order to, to be able to afford it, you know, maybe on a larger policy, two, three, four million dollar policy. It'd be more beneficial for that premium to go elsewhere. Gotcha. So, so from that standpoint, if if for some reason they're in any situation in which they, the costs of the premium and, and et cetera are too much, they can basically look into this as an option. Because um, most most of the term policies usually end at like fifty five ish, right, or sixty five. Yeah, there's some to go up to 75. It needs to be convertible term. If it's term and it's not convertible, then there's nothing we can do. It has to have a conversion writer. As okay. far as universal life, um, it's pretty much the entire course. Uh, we, can, we can do it all the way up to the very end of the policy. So the thing there is, is the qualification process. So they have to be 70 or older. They could be 65 or older if they have health concerns. You, we have done cases, you know, 45, 50 year olds, but uh, the reason that that case was possible because they were almost terminal, they had serious health implications. So it's going to come down to 15 years or less of life expectancy for any policy to really qualify. Got it. Thanks. Yes, sir. Very good. Okay, Paul. Yeah, uh, thanks for the presentation. Nice job. Um, yeah, I guess my question um, 
you seem to have a competitive advantage over the the carriers. Um, you know, if if someone were to end their policy and just kind of cash it in with the carrier, you're saying that that they would get a better deal with you. I, I'm presuming that you broker a deal with the investor side. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Um, you know, what's your secret sauce? You know, how do you how do you accomplish that? It, it, am I correct that you know you maybe uh, broker a deal with with the investors? So I've sourced investors, um, and then when we have a client that has a policy, I'm going to submit that policy individually to every single investor. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pin one against the other. Say I get eight hundred fifty thousand as an offer from one, and then I take it to the other one. Say, hey, I have an offer for eight fifty. If you can beat that offer, we have some grounds to stand on. Otherwise. I need to find if I can get more than the 850. Right. I mean, it makes sense. Yes. Okay. Very good. Like you said, no, it was good. And like you said, it's the investment that they're looking at for sure. So they have to be worthwhile and also figure out to maintain. Does it ever happen? How often does it occur where like they buy the policy, but the person that lives the policy like that is a term converter or whatever. Is there ever those instances or they're always going to benefit in the end somehow? Absolutely. You're, you're absolutely correct. There are times where they'll buy a policy and um, the insured will live longer. Uh, and that's the risk of the investor. You know, the point is, is, the client still got the money. If they live longer than, uh, from an investment standpoint, they they've already calculated that it's mitigated. So, you know, it, it's the law of large numbers. Essentially, <laughs> the more policies you have, you can you can be wrong on a few and still. You know, again, the benefit, the again, the benefit of the investor group buying it that has multitudes of policies. So if one goes south, right. it doesn't really matter. Right. Charles, I saw your hand there. Couple questions, Carmelo. Uh, one, you mentioned state um, settlement access requirements in was it twenty six states? Half the half the states, fourteen right now. Fourteen, sorry. <clears throat> um, why is legislation required? Are some states not allowing settlements, or are insurers not allowing settlements because they don't want to? Uh, what's the what's the legislative dynamics behind that thing? So, a life settlement is not in the best interest of a life insurance company. The life insurance company makes a lot of their profit from policies that are never used, you know, or policies that are surrendered for pennies. So it's in their benefit not to have life settlements be available. Right now in 14 states, it's been identified that a life settlement is very advantageous for the, uh, the insured. And so as more states get on board and Lisa, the Life Insurance Settlement Association, they're, um, they're very large in this space trying to fight for the insured to be able to, to do a life settlement. So where it stands now, the 14 states that allow a life settlement or that require a life settlement to be an option means that as an advisor, if you don't offer it, frankly, you could be in trouble. The other states, that's not the case yet. Are your friends, um, investors, uh, lobbying in those other states to legalize settlements? Again, these are institutional investors. I don't really know. I would assume they would. It would, it would only be logical. Um, the Life Insurance Settlement Association, they lobby for it. Okay. That's interesting. So um, how big will this market get once the other states legalize this pro-consumer option? multi-billion dollar industry without a doubt in my opinion uh, i can't give you an exact number but if you just look back at the fact of how many billions are lapsing every single year and the majority of them being an opportunity for a life settlement the the problem really entails when a life settlement is is mandated as an option in all 50 states the calculations that life insurance companies do in order to find your premium they're going to have to increase. So there is a downside, you know, to that because premiums are going to be more expensive if this is mandated in all 50 states because they have to mitigate for their business. Absolutely. I was going to just add that comment because if they get more and more of these bought out and then they're, you know, project them to kind of fail and they don't, then they got to build that in. They're not yeah. going to lose money on this project. Right. For sure. The, um, as you're seeing any other states, is there any that are trending that are getting ready to 
make these kind of moves or is it's kind of in the dark until it suddenly appears? It's, it's kind of in the dark until something appears. Um, I do follow and, and try to get information on it, but it, there's not like a, a really good resource where I can see which states are, are pending or whatnot. I know um, Canada right now, they just filed a bill 192 where, where they're beginning to, to legalize and mandate life settlements as well. So if that goes through, then Canada would open up as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if you know much of the history of it, but in those instances where the states did decide to do this, who was the kind of type of person that introduced the legislation to make that so? I'm not aware. There's one case in particular. It's Russell versus I can't I can't I can't I can't think of it right now. Um, I'll get that information. Maybe you could put it in the comments section. Under yeah, the, well, right that continuing the conversation is really where that's very beneficial. So that's good. Yeah, just curious to see, you know, because it like you know, it seems like it's such a bizarre issue in certain ways to a legislator. It's like, why even bother introducing anything about Brown this? I mean, it's like a distraction almost, even though it's good, but you know, in the bigger scope of things, it's like a, a non-starter almost, but yet somebody decided to pursue it, which is good. I'm right. just curious what's like the triggering thing or what kind of, maybe it was a doctor or somebody's friend is some, you know, somehow they put a little pressure to beer and got it started. Charles, was a case. I just can't remember all the details right now, so I don't want to say it, but, um, mm -hmm. Uh, basically they couldn't get their death benefit. And um, so they sued the life insurance company. And mm -hmm. then that's what, that's what initiated all of One this. thing led to the other. Sure. Yeah. Charles. Um, <clears throat> just continuing that um, risk of higher life insurance premiums. I'm sure the life insurance lobbyists will exaggerate that risk of how much the premiums would increase if you had settlement access in all 50 States. Um, what are you, what is your side saying in counter to that, that if there is an increase, it won't be more than a couple percentage points. Uh, it's got to be marginal, not that big a deal. At this point, there's not any real documentation on what life insurance companies are, are deeming to be the percentage of increase in premium for them to mitigate this risk. Um, again, we're only at 14 states, so it seems marginal in my opinion to the life insurance companies at this stage. Sure. Definitely. All right. Well, we're kind of wrapping things up a little bit. Let's see if we got any last questions here for Carmelo tonight. We definitely are excited to know about these options. Like you said, a lot of people, you've sort of seen some of those ads on TV, you know, it's my money and I want it now kind of a thing, but it, <laughs> did, but it just didn't seem to like, you know, it just kind of came and went because they were on there for a while and then off the, off the air they went and, you know, they didn't persist like reverse mortgages. Those forever on TV, just new right. spokesperson. But this kind of had to stay in the sunshine. But like you said, it's going to grow. The poppy is aging. It has to, you know. It's absolutely going to grow. And I think mm -hmm. it's a wonderful opportunity, mm -hmm. um, not only for agents, but, but for their clients. You know, this is win, win, win. And that's something that's really hard to find. Typically so. Well, that's great. Well, listen, Carmel, yeah. I appreciate Yes, go ahead. Um, so how can... Um agents reach you um, or would you even want um, elderly clients to reach you? I mean, uh, who, who are your target markets here? I work with anyone. I work, I work with individual elderly clients and I also work with agencies and um, IMOs, like I mentioned, general agencies. So my contact information is up on the screen. My phone number is 850-212-2861. My email's there. And I also have my website at the bottom, lifesettlementpro.com. Um, that's the the website is marked towards both agents as well as the general consumer so there's sections for both of them to review super and you can always reach me by phone text email 24 7. um this is my baby so i never close <laughs> okay go i'll make sure i don't I'll have something to do at 2 a.m when i'm typically awake so that'll be <laughs> great <laughs>